you heard the news? You have got to be kidding me. Winnie Ruth Judd. No, Winnie Ruth Judd, the escaped from the mental hospital. You don't remember this case? Oh, where is it? So, do you remember back in 1933, there was a woman who escaped from the Arizona State Mental Hospital? That was the infamous Winnie Ruth Judd. Mm hmm. I think this story calls for a drink. Would you like one? Oh. Suit it yourself. So, I think to get the whole story, we need to start at the beginning. So, Miss Winnie Ruth Judd, born to a minister in Darlington, Indiana, small town gal strict rules and as we all know rules can sometimes break a person and I think it certainly did for Miss Winnie Ruth. So Miss Winnie Ruth ends up getting married at age 19 mm -hmm, to a man 22 years her senior. A bit older but he's a doctor so she thinks why not? You know, just thinking it's a girl's dream. They end up moving around, place to place to place, wearing her down. Eventually, he tries to open up a practice in Mexico. Does not go well. Mm -mm. Ends up landing them in Los Angeles, California. Fortunately, by that time, they're half broke. Her husband, addicted to drugs, who knows what kind, probably all sorts. And she has developed tuberculosis, so as one would, you know, trying to escape to the dry air, she heads over to Phoenix, Arizona. Mm hmm So here, she meets two roommates. One, an Anne Leroy, and two, a Hedwig Samuelson. Goes by Sammy. So... They all end up working in the same medical facility. She's a medical secretary at this point. And she, by chance, ends up meeting this uh, lumber tycoon of sorts. Mm-hmm, older guy, 44. So he starts coming around, hanging out, playing bridge, having drinks, probably having other things. But what's really interesting is that one night in October, I think the 16th, things get crazy. So, sweet former Little Miss Indiana, Winnie Ruth Judd, she decides that even though she's got a semi-relationship with this tycoon of sorts, this old Happy Jack, that they call him, she finds out that Happy Jack has been a bit happy with all three of the girls. She doesn't like that. So she comes to the conclusion that if she can't have them, then nobody can. So she pops both girls right in their beds, mm-hmm, kills them both dead. Now. The thing I can't piece together and still don't quite understand about this report is that police say that they were shot in their beds. Now, they only found one mattress, which already strikes me as curious. I don't know what happened to the other one. But the one that they did find, they found a block down the street and only peppered with blood spatter. Pretty curious for somebody who was shot in it. Unless those bodies got out of there real quick. Either way, that's what they allege. Now, whether they were shot in their beds, out of their beds, they definitely died from gunshot wounds, but 
they keel over, and now Miss Winnie is stuck with two bodies and none the wiser of what to do. She waits two days on this. Two full days. She comes back to the scene of the crime. Nobody's called. Nobody's checked in. But she knows she's not off the hook. What's she gonna do with these bodies? So she, in her brilliant thinking, is like, you know what? I think I miss my husband. She decides to head off for Lo Los Angeles, but she realizes can't leave these bodies here. Mm -mm. No, sir. So what does she do? She decides to take them with her. Right. How would one do that? You might be asking yourself. I ask myself the same thing. Well, she takes your typical moving trunk, quite large, throws Miss Leroy in there nice and tight, stuff some, you know, clothing, some mementos, that type of thing, papers, around the body. Closes that, locks it tight. Hedwig, on the other hand, Sammy, a bit more difficult. Apparently she was too heavy to pick up, and she didn't have any more large cases to put her in, so she dismembers her. Mm -hmm. Puts her in all kinds of cases, even a hat box had a leg in it. Pretty horrific. Does the same thing though with her. Stuffs all these papers, some clothes around. I guess, I, I'm not sure what the point of that was. Maybe so it wasn't wiggling around. Either way, she gets to the station, heading out to Los Angeles. Well, passengers and staff alike begin to notice that there is a large amount of flies hovering around a couple of old Winnie's cases. Mm hmm. And on top of that, they reach to high heaven, and they're seeping blood. Now, you would think that with that kind of curiosity happening right in front of their eyes, some people would have raised a bigger stink about it. But nope. Sweet little bag boy. Mm-hmm. A fellow who went by Anderson? Anderson. This kid decides, probably trying to avoid everything else, decides that she's probably got a dead deer carcass in her bags. Uh-huh. Well. So, he comes around and says, Excuse me, Miss Judd. Couldn't help but notice that your bags stink like death. They're bleeding out the bottom. You got a dead deer carcass in there. Little Miss Winnie, so sweet, cute and pretty. Plays none the wiser. She pretends like she doesn't know what's going on. So he finds this a bit curious. A normal person would. So what does he do? He escapes to go contact the police, good boy. Now, the police end up meeting her at the station. Not the police station train station. So, now, it gets really interesting, because they notice the flies, the stank, the blood, they see all of it. So they ask her, what's in the bags? Open them up for us. And wouldn't you know it, Winnie left the key with her husband. They bought that story. This is why we're better at this job. So, rather than escorting her to go get the key from her husband, they allow her to leave. So she, seeing her chance of opportunity, runs off, gives a little ring-a-ding to her brother, tells him, you know, I need a pickup from the station. So he comes, picks her up, being a good supportive brother. He even notices the bags. Doesn't say anything about it, doesn't even ask her about it. But, you know, he gets a little bit of a side eye. Where the police are at this point, who knows? But anyway, so she ends up escaping with him for a little bit. Him not realize he's transporting a very suspicious person at this point. He drops her off randomly. Two days go by. She's nowhere to be seen. No one knows what happened. 
Anyway, so she turns up again, police snap her, and she is covered in bruises. She's even got a gunshot wound to one of her hands. Self-inflicted. Allegedly. There was a really odd fella at one point who did show up to greet her in jail saying something along the lines of, you know, being an accomplice to her, but she cut that cord real quick and was like, don't you say anything. Police didn't even collect the guy to hold him in custody for a while, didn't question him, never came up in trial. Oddest thing. Don't know what was going on there. Handsome fellow, though. Either way, no one knows what happened to that, but so now it's just Winnie taking the blame for this. Mm -hmm. So the trial comes. Seems like a pretty clear-cut case as to what happened. The reasoning behind the argument, nobody really knows. Winnie does claim at some point trying to throw old Happy Jack under a bus. Tells the court that, essentially, there was a day that she was coming home to play a regular game of bridge. Now, old Happy Jack was there at one point and had left by then. And another fourth gal was there and had also left. Now this really upset Winnie because now there's a fourth girl in the mix. She's got another person to compete with. And allegedly, that was the start of the conversation and the end of the conversation. She, however, twists the tables just a little bit. Mm -hmm. She claims that the other girls, being jealous or whatever, start to attack her. Mm -hmm. Who knows if that's true or not, it's hard to say, but she claims that all the bruising that she took was all in self-defense. Mm -hmm. She did say, though, that the old hand wound, the gunshot, She did admit to that being self-inflicted, but but it was interesting though. So clearly they found her guilty, which who wouldn't? Old Happy Jack gets off scot-free. Who would have thought? Doesn't even get questioned, in fact. But. They end up giving her the death penalty, so she's arranged to be hanged. The day comes in the nth hour, right before. Word comes in, and she apparently got it overturned and was sentenced to a life within the Arizona State Mental Hospital. Mm-hmm, where, not too long later, she ends up walking right out the front doors. Mm-hmm. Anyway. They caught her, so she's back there now. I was in the paper, I thought you knew. Nice uh, walk down old memory lane anyway. But it's an interesting story nonetheless. Got anything new for me?